Hello everyone and welcome to Board Game Revolution's interview series. I have a really special guest with me today. Uh, I can't believe he's on with me and uh, you guys may know who he is, you may not, and if you don't, you will. Uh, real quick, before I get into who my special guest is, I'm going to show you their video on their brand new campaign, Eternal Adversaries. <laughs> ourselves about our various concerns. We were being watched keenly by envious eyes. Chaos forces beyond our imagination prepare to wreck not just our world, but all of the worlds tied to ours. All the parallel universes one in which the Norse civilization survived to the present, another with the Teutonic Knights or the Celts, yet another with the new Bushido Empire, all empires of man, all civilized, content, and unaware of each other. But then, Chaos made its move. All the worlds clashed together. Timelines ripped and overlapped. Heroes from every world joined together to stop the advance of chaos. The worlds must be saved. At least one world, safe for humanity, must arise from the destruction. Chaos must be stopped. Choose your team. Do you fight for order or for chaos? In Eternal Adversary, you play a hero of order or chaos. Build up your hero as you play, getting tougher, faster, and deadlier. If you fight for order, you can use human technology and wisdom to bolster your hero. If you fight for chaos, you yourself control and benefit from the random hells. The two teams, Order and Chaos, perform different tasks. As Order, seek out and destroy the Chaos Rifts, healing the universe. As Chaos, find the tokens of disorder and carry them to your sinister lord. Both teams seek to advance their marker down the doom track in a race for survival. When a team reaches the end of the track, the final battle begins. Both sides now stake everything on one great clash. Has your team gained enough experience or hurt the enemy enough to be victorious? you decide in Eternal Adversary. Back us on Kickstarter now and also get free the exclusive Anubite Hero of Order plus the exclusive Chaos Lich Arch Enemy. This game looks amazing. I I can't thank this man enough for all he's done to, uh, for our industry uh, in board games as well as video games. And my special guest who I have with me today is none other than Sandy Peterson. Sandy, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing great. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. Had a happy 4th of July. I did. Did you? Yes, yes. I, t I spent it completely vegetating. <laughs> me too, actually, with a few uh, board games yeah, in front my, of me. My, uh, my, my son's... Uh, my grandkids were unfortunately sick, so even they didn't come over. So it was just me and my wife and my dogs. Well, uh, did you at least enjoy some fireworks outside? There were some fireworks outside. I watched Big Jake 
with John Wayne. So that was my my tribute to being patriotic. <laughs> if you've never seen it, it's fabulous. And what, what was it called again? So the viewers, Big Jake. Big Jake. It might have the one of the very best character introductions, at least of John Wayne, I've ever seen, which happens about uh, 15, 20 minutes in the movie. Also, the introduction to the bad guys is great. I... The, uh, they show this little this little town, little uh, ranch, and people are all funny, and they're interacting and doing this and that, and the and the the maid gets mad at the cook, and they're doing this, and, the, and you can't know all the people in about five, ten minutes' time. Then a bunch of raiders come over from... Uh, led by richard boone and kill everyone oh god and you're like really pissed off at him because they just murder all these guys you care about and then big jake comes in but it's anyway i recommend it i'll definitely have to check it out so for those who don't know who this man is uh sandy peterson has a resume starting way back from what is it the 1970s you know well my early first 80s published game was in 1980 so i guess then all right, so for those who don't know who, who they are, let, let's talk about your resume. So what what got you into Cthulhu as well as into the role-playing world? And then we're just going to go forward from there. Well, um, as far as my gaming resume does, if I was to do a, a CV for, for your fans, um, I got into Cthulhu a long, long time ago when I was only eight years old. But in 1980 and 81, I uh, worked with Chaosium to publish the very first Lovecraft um, based game ever, which was the Call of Cthulhu role-playing game. And that was kind of the start of Lovecraft even being known by anyone in the world, because before that time, he was, like, pathetically obscure. Um, uh, shortly after that, just from Lovecraft's point of view, that's when Stuart Gordon came out with his movies, uh, The Reanimator, From Beyond, uh, Dagon, and then that started fil filtering through geek culture, like, through the movie horror nerd culture, whereas my game, Call of Cthulhu, kind of filtered through the role-playing gaming community, and that, so Lovecraft is known now. Anyway, so I started off at Chaosium, and for about eight years, I worked there. I, I was participated in basically everything they did. Ring World, Rune Quest, Elf Quest, uh, uh, the Ghostbusters role-playing game, which I got an award for. Um, well, that's and, amazing. Uh, of all things, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but <clears throat> I did that for eight years, and then I moved to Microprose Software in uh, on the other coast. And at Microprose, I participated with uh, Sid Meier doing Civilization, and I did other games. I worked on a game called uh, Hyper Hyperspeed, Lightspeed, um, and a bunch of things, you know, at, at, as you do. Uh, but you know, the, the best known one is clearly uh, um, oh, Darklands. But the best known is uh, civilization, obviously, right. And then after that, I went to id Software, where I went right in. I, w I did most of the levels on the original Doom and Doom 2, and then I worked on Quake, and then from Micropro, uh, sorry, from id, I went to Ensemble Studios, where I was in the entire Age of Empire series, Age of Mythology series, uh, their, uh, their Halo Wars game. Uh, which is well known among people yes. that like real time strategy games. From there, I taught school at Southern Methodist University for two years at the graduate level. So I was teaching people that had gra that had master's degrees or they're getting master's degrees, and uh, I didn't have a master's degree myself, <laughs> but I knew a lot about the industry. And from there, I went into a small uh, failed, uh, a small failing uh, phone game company for a little bit and then i published my board game cthulhu wars and that kind of revitalized my my career and now i run the game the company peterson games and we have a bunch of games to our credit and are well known in the board game field i hope so ever since the beginning you've always had this passion for lovecraftian you know uh te text and and for you know his world that he made was that a passion ever since, you know, you were little that you, you, well, I mean, it? when I was eight years old, um, my, we were in a temporary house. I mean, we were in the temporary house three years. Right. But my dad kept all his old science fiction books in a big, in big boxes in the basement. So I would sneak down there. I was one of those annoying, precocious kids that no one likes. <laughs> so I went down there and I'd get these books out and I read them. So I read Tarzan of the apes, you know, and, uh, and, the, and his old pulp magazines from the 40s and 50s. And then I came across this one book called The Dunwich Horror and Others. And the stories were short, so I thought I could get through them. And it was Lovecraft. Right. And I'd never read anything like Lovecraft. I mean, I'd read Poe, 
you know, and like him. And I'm not saying I understood everything I was reading in Lovecraft. I was only eight or nine years old, but I really liked it. And then Lovecraft was incredibly hard to find. He was almost out of print. Right. And then I lost that book. And for three years, I had z- almost zero Lovecraft. And then a friend of mine returned it to me. He'd borrowed it apparently for three years. <laughs> um, and then a few years after, so I had that book again. And then a few years after that, the local, I found out the local college had the Lovecraft books in hardcover, the old Arkham House first editions there at the library. So I'd go and read them there. And then they found out that they were like valuable first editions. So they locked them away. So like teenagers couldn't read them anymore. And then I was saved in 19, when I was 17 years old, because Ballantine came out with paperbacks of the Lovecraft stories. And then I could have them and read all these stories I hadn't read before. Cause I only had that one book and that book annoyingly had a long introduction that talked all about Lovecraft and named all kinds of stories that weren't in the book <laughs> that I had. So I'd never read them. And so probably this long quest of like almost 10 years duration, trying to find Lovecraft is part of what got me hooked on him, mm-hmm. you know, and now that Lovecraft's really easy to find, maybe people won't get hooked on him the way I, the method that I was, but I still think that that was, that's how it worked for me. Well, I mean, you've created this, I'm going to say a following because you've brought it into a more mainstream type of era. I mean, you, you've definitely helped aid it into, you know, from your work in id Software on both Doom, Quake, you know, and moving forward. And, and even in your board games, you've made it more pop I culture. Even, I even uh, helped executive produce a movie from Lovecraft, uh, The Whisperer in Darkness. Really? Yeah. Another part of your CV. See, you've really helped push it into a more mainstream area. I mean, I don't think, like, games that such as um, what Simon just put out or what Fantasy Flight's been putting out wouldn't have gotten the traction that they do now if it weren't for you. So well, you- there's a number of Lovecraft role-playing games out, and all of them exist, I think, because of Call of Cthulhu. So, mm-hmm. yeah, it has spawned things. And in that regard, I think I'm, in an extent, willing or not, I'm doing kind of what Lovecraft did, because Lovecraft was actually really active in the Amateur Press Association, mm-hmm. and he was extremely, and he like had a voluminous correspondence He's the person that encouraged other authors to use his creations in their stories. So the Necronomicon isn't just a Lovecraft book. A lot of guys use it. Frank Belknap Long and Robert E. Howard and all these other guys. <laughs> Same goes for Cthulhu. These other guys. So when I was a kid growing up and didn't and you know there was no internet, I would read Lovecraft stories. And later on, I'd read some story by some other person, and the Necronomicon's in it, and mentions of Neolithotep, and I'm like. What the heck? Is it real? <laughs> right. and, the, and 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 it, and it gave itself an aura, an eerie, fr- like frisson of realness that these other authors writing in different periods, different characters, all knew about the Necronomicon, and all knew about Cthulhu, and all knew about this, and so that, and so I think that by um, that, whether I intended to or not, the fact that that Lovecraft is spread all over the place, and other guys are now doing other games based on it, I think is what Lovecraft was consciously doing. Right. And and it seems like you also take that same type of ideology in the way that you run your business, because it's all about, you know, you guys as a team, you know, helping each other out. You know, we, we were talking about this earlier. Yeah. Yeah. My, my, my feeling is that the board game industry is actually expanding still rather than, rather than contracting it. And at least in this period of it, that it's better for there to be more good games, less scam artists. To have like, if games in general were good, I think that helps everyone. So I don't view the I view our our rivals for board games, my rivals, not as other board game companies, but as you know, TV, the internet, um, other sources of people doing things besides playing board games. Right, <laughs> right, and in kind of the same way, enemy of the real. The enemy of the railroads wasn't other railroad companies; it was airplanes and right. trucks, right? <laughs> That's true. So, <laughs> well, I hope I, hope, I want to be the airplane and trucks, not the railroad, right? But <laughs> <laughs> well, and not only that, what would you say attributed to this explosion in in game board, um, you know, culture as well as in you know how you view now? You guys aren't competitors. Well, the big change in board game culture came. Well, I think there's. Well, the not being competitors thing is, I think, 
I'm not saying it's just me, but there's but there are obviously other co- companies that consider the other people to be competitors. This stuff, right? But uh, I my attitude is that they are they are peers, you know, mm-hmm. to be to be respected. But I think what the, what what uh, brought about the board game revolution was there was like three steps to it, and the first was way back in the fifties when Avalon Hill came out with the first board war games, and they had these complicated strategic games. It wasn't just Monopoly and Clue anymore. Okay, and then and then these were went on for all, and they were all war games. Like right? there's all you know, started, SPI should do it, other companies started doing it, and then yeah, uh, sometime in the 1980s in Europe, mainly Germany, um, some people started developing like re- like real games that were fun to play, didn't take a million hours like Monopoly, and were interesting, like Settlers of Catan, for example, right, Carcassonne, and then uh, these started. These infiltrated back to America, and the people that used to play the hardcore war games got interested in playing these. And the people who didn't play hardcore war games but still just wanted the fun family game and who wants to play Monopoly seriously, right? right. <laughs> they'd get like they'd get um, uh, Settlers Catan, and there's like, hey, here's a fun game. It doesn't last a million hours, and there's things you're doing in it, not just playing, right? And so these started expanding, and then other people started wanting to imitate these, and you had this board game explosion happening in the 90s, basically, with these new games. Um, and then companies started appearing like Real Grand Games and Z-Man Games and all the, you know, uh, Fantasy Flight got a start then. And then uh, this was the second stage in board games spreading all over. And then the third stage happened in, in about 2012 when... Kickstarter crowdfunding started to uh, make itself available to board games. And there was a period of three years. In, in 2010, there was, I think, uh, $500,000 on Kickstarter for board games. Mm. And in 2011, it was $3 million. And in 2012, it was $50 million. And then and now it's like the biggest thing in, in Kickstarter. Board games are huge. And board games, unlike most Kickstarter projects, usually fund. Right. I think the last time I took a look at the numbers, uh, for this year alone, we were sitting at about 67% success rate out of yeah. all... For board uh, games. Yeah, for, for all board games. games. is lower than that, I think. Or if it's not... I mean, video games have a lower success rate, right? Right. And right. probably should, given how long they take to do and how they always underestimate money, right? Yes. I mean, I've worked in video games for 20 years. But, uh, so, yeah. So, so what, what, but what this did was it meant that you could do your board game, but back in... Even during the boom, if I wanted to do a board game to do it, I had to design the game. Then I had to push it for someone. Like, hey, Fantasy Flight, do I want to play my game? Asmodee, do you want my game? And then they would look at it and think about it, and then they would publish it or maybe not. And you know, and then they didn't know how many. But with Kickstarter, I could do it on my own, right? Nobody was going to buy Cthulhu Wars. Right. right. Cthulhu War, no company. It was too big too expensive it was a new type of game because it cost 200 bucks no one had a game like that my feeling was that while i don't think that every game should cost 200 bucks i think it's okay for a a a hardcore gamer to have one or two cadillacs on his shelves instead of all yugos right and hondas you know like one nice thing it's like you don't want to eat at at mcdonald's every single night when you're going out that's true everyone so we have a steak and instead of bitching about how much the steak costs you just enjoy it right so the same goes for Cthulhu Wars. Not every game should be expensive. It's okay to have one or two of these class games. And so that's what I thought it was. But, but a game company, that's too risky for them to try, right? What if it flops and they put all this money into this huge expensive right. thing, right. And then it, right? But by going to Kickstarter, I could find out that there was enough people who were bent like me that would, that would fund it. And, I got, and it was $1.4 million gross into Kickstarter. Now, obviously, I didn't take all of that home or even anything but a tiny fraction right. of it. Right. But, but it enabled me to make the game and found the company. And then I could do it. Then I, I now have my own company. We still kickstart because when we do that, it lets us know how popular the game is going to be and lets us know about how many we need to print. We print a few extra, you know, and uh, and pay for our tooling and stuff up front. It's really, really useful. And uh, and also one of the best things about Kickstarter, this is going to sound weird, is that when a Kickstarter campaign fails, and I've had plenty of campaigns that failed, all right? But when it fails, that is a gift straight from God because I know not to do that game. Right, right. I said, I said people don't want this game, don't do it. Whereas if I was a regular old-fashioned game company, just publishing games, putting out there, 
then I would just simply have had a flop. This way, all I invested was the Kickstarter stuff. Right, and that, you know, that's which very is, true. Or, I didn't produce any games. You know, I mean, I mean, I spent money on that, but compared to actually making a game. So, how would you say that crowdfunding and you know now more direct interaction with your direct customer has affected your uh, games in in this way? Well, I, I, well, we're constantly in touch with those customers via the, the Kickstarter and other campaigns. I now have regu- a regular dis- bunch of Discord channels people are always talking to me on. Um, but I'll, on the Kickstarter, I'll, I, mean, I go into the comment section and talk to people, and they say what they like or what they don't like. And this influences what I do in the game. Like People will say, we want to have this stuff. Let me give you a really direct example. Here in Eternal Adversary, we decided that we were going to have uh, two people be the Lord of Chaos and the Lord of Order. And these people, they had to pay a premium, and they would get to design a whole new unit for the game. And we actually live streamed it, mm-hmm. them designing it with me and and our artist. And so one of them, like it was his grandpa. <laughs> his grandpa was a Ukrainian partisan during World War II, so it was kind of cool. So we like did his grandpa. Then another guy had this fantasy monster he made up for his D and D campaign, and so we did that. You know, and then th- now those are going to be in the game, and we've modified them so they have rules that fit that are balanced for my. So I'm happy with my perspective. These guys are thrilled they got to participate. And these guys are literally as part of the process. You know, I mean, I, I'm very interactive with the fans. As an example, I will put names of fans into my rule books as examples of play. You know, just their first names so they can't be really litigious about it. But, you know, you know, I, I have a guy, Gilberto Gillum, who started, uh, you know, who's now in my game, always losing in the examples, right? But but he's there. <laughs> but, hey, but, you know, that's a nice little touch, you know, because you're, you're kind of doing a little throwback to the people that help you continue to make your games. Yeah. Well, my feeling about these people is not so much. I mean, I, I guess I never feel like I'm like I'm the, the I mean, I am the designer, but I feel like I'm designing things I really like to play and I'm a fan. And these guys are fans like me. So these are my other other fans that are kind of all on my same team instead of me being the guy on Mount Olympus that makes the games and sends them down to the little people to enjoy. I kind of feel like we're all like, if I wasn't doing the game, this, if someone else was designing Cthulhu Wars, I'd be in there playing it with, right. with them, you know? So. Yeah. I mean, I mean I, your passion basically. I mean, games. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say your passion just does. It's not one of those. that just stops at the door. It continues right. forward, and and everything that you you do, and you you continue moving forward. Yeah, one of the saddest stories I heard back in the day was I was talking to one of the designers from uh, uh, Avalon Hill before they went kaput, you know, and uh, and and I, and I started talking enthusiastically about games I liked and the games I was playing because I still play them, you know. Um, and uh, this is this is some years ago, but he said uh, he said, "Oh, I don't enjoy or play games anymore." I said, "But your job is literally to be a game designer." He says, "Oh yeah, I still design games," and uh, but he wasn't he wasn't interested in playing them. And I just was, "Why would you do that then? Why would you be a designer?" And it might have been because he had been assigned by the company to work on Doctor Ruth's game of Good Sex, <laughs> which probably is not the most inspiring project, right? <laughs> um, and I and it has a happy ending because because years later I met him again a couple about five years later and I said so what's going up with you now and he he was all, he was really interested in Magic the Gathering at the time he'd gotten back into the games because of Magic the Gathering so at least it has one good thing to its credit right right and uh, so he he'd come back right he'd found himself as a designer again but uh, but I, but I remember resolving when that guy said he didn't like games anymore and didn't enjoy playing them that if I ever got to the point where I didn't like games and wasn't playing them I would stop doing them and I would do something else. Right. So it, it, for you... I didn't it, ever want to be that situation. Right. But for you, it's not just you and your company. Your sons work with you as well. If they're not working on production, they're actually designing games. Well, yeah. Well, you have to understand that all my kids were raised in a household where there was games all the time and dad was designing games all the time and I was playing games all the time. And so they're like really interested in games. Just like I was raised in a household where my dad really liked old science fiction books. Well, they weren't old to him, I guess, right? They were new. And so he liked science fiction. That was all over the place. And he would take me to see all the monster movies. And in those days, they didn't have the genres like now. Like, it, they didn't distinguish if it was a science fiction, like, space opera, or if it was a giant monster, or if it was a ghost story. They were all just, like, you know, monster movies. Right. And so I would see this huge range of movies from The Frozen Dead, you know, to... Uh, uh, um, 
uh, like space station alpha and just loved all the stuff. And that's how, that's what created me partly. And so my kids are created, it has echoed down to them, right. you know, my interests and my games. And you can see in the wall behind me, the, the row of games here. Let me, let me take this camera and uh, you can see it kind of goes down there a ways. <laughs> yes, it does. These are all games either that I have purchased or that I have gotten in trade um, from somebody. Because you know, at, at the game company, at the game conventions, people will want copies of my games, and so then I will say, "Sure, let's let's swap." And then they'll give me games, and I'll give them games, and so it doesn't actually cost me anything. I guess it cost me the cost of my game, but right. In effect, I got the cost of their game for a lot less because I got it at cost. <laughs> That's true. I mean, like, and. Right. Do you have you played every single one of those games? Because that's a lot. I have played. I have not played every single one of these games, but I have played the great majority. Okay. Some of them I've only played once, and then I kind of went, oh, and then I didn't play anymore. Right. You know. <laughs> but some of them I play again and again. You know. This is actually is one of my, one of my favorite games. This dumb bag here. This is sack. It's a German game called Bausack by Z-Man Games, which is a mm. terrific party game. If you ever a family reunion? With a bunch of people who aren't gamers and you want to have a game they'll play, they'll play this. Just so you know. What, and what's the name again? Because and how how this hard is, is it to find? Sack Nor, right? But the original game is called Bow Sack, which leads to all kinds of terrible things that they will call it. <laughs> yeah. Sack, but you but you're taking uh, you're. T- I'm just showing you an example of a game that I like a lot. I play once. Block is also the like, but uh, you basically you're built, building stacks of. Uh, of wooden blocks of all different and uh and then when your tower falls over you lose but you're able to give other people stacks shapes they have to use and they might be terrible shapes like spheres right (laughs) so so uh, when it comes to i still play games i play with people that don't like games by doing games like this right i play with people who like games by doing games you know like uh you know valley of the mammoth or evo uh, and I steal ideas from these games all the time for my games. And here's another case in point. So Evo, um, the map is different for different numbers of players, right? And one of the and so I stole an idea from that from Cthulhu Wars. In Cthulhu Wars, if you're playing the three player game, you use one side of the map, and if you're playing the four, five player game, you use the other side of the map. And what Evo did, and what I do too, is if you're playing the four player game. You flip one of them over, so you have one three and one five. Then you have two different configurations. I thought that was a great idea, so I took it. Well, I, Thus, could, I that, that, that was games. that was actually what I was going to ask: is what influences you in your game designs? And you know, it's great to hear that other games, you know, can still have that effect. Yeah, and... I mean, Evil has nothing to do with Cthulhu Wars except for that, but it's got that, right? <laughs> you know. Or well, some of the game, can't think which it was, but it had this, um, it was one of those games with a big, thick box, you know, like Cthulhu Wars, that takes forever to come off and, this, and all the air pressure put on. But this game, in the um, in the sides of it near the top, there was a cutout in the cardboard, so you get your finger under the game board and get it out without squeezing into the edges and damaging the game. Oh, that's nice. So I did, so I did that, too. Yeah. That was just a construction thing. It wasn't even part of the game design, but... Yeah, but there's like, those things that, you know... that are in, Right, th- that are little things that, like, add to the value of the whole game as a as a whole. Just like game trays now, um, that where people are now putting game trays inside their games that are individualized per player. Like, that, that like, for me, adds a huge value to the game because it, it's convenient. You know, I don't have to deal with bags or... Um, you know, th- just one I piece know of cardboard. Like I'm still one of the guys that prefers bags and throw away all my trays <laughs> to get them. But, really? uh, yeah. <laughs> but then of course my game boxes also don't always fit and stuff because I don't use the game trays. Yeah. So, I, so I, I pay for it. But, uh, you know, one time, cause my, my friend, he, I'm talking about hates bags. We played a little prank on him where we bagged every single card in his game awesome. of uh, architects. Because <laughs> why not? <laughs> it makes sense. No, I'm all about pranks. I mean, you've, I don't know if you followed my my April first uh, Kickstarters I've done for the last three years. I've seen the the two years prior. What'd you do this year? We did 
a the biggest one ever. It was like one hundred and forty three thousand dollars in one day. <laughs> it was it was uh, 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 we called it Cataclysm, and it was all about we're doing uh, it's, it's the crazy cat Kickstarter where we're doing the Bubatsis faction for Cthulhu Wars full of cats. There has to be cats from outer space, and we have all these cats. And basically, you get like a whole faction of cats, Lovecraftian cats, to play. And it actually is a balanced faction that works, but it, it's also like a goof, right? Because it's you're playing cats, right? But you know, it has like cats from Mars and cats from Saturn and Bubastis <laughs> and cats from Uranus and all right, all this crazy stuff. So, well, and then we, and then I finally did my giant albino penguin um, figure because I keep it's been a running joke in the company for years that I won't do a giant albino penguin because it's too stupid, right? And, um, it's more it's a thing from a Lovecraft story, and so so this has the giant albino penguin. Oh, that's amazing! And, uh, and, and I mean, and I mean the uh, the video for it is pretty funny. In the background, we're playing Indian Love Call by uh, Slim Whitman, you know, and we and we talk about how great it is to be a crazy cat lady, and you know, but. Oh, that's... But it's actually a product that is coming out. The other two were just, were just complete goofs. I mean, we we have a product that you get for it. Right. But the first one was like Lonely Hearts Deep Ones that want to have sex with you. <laughs> and the second was uh, Pet Monsters. And then I don't know what we're going to do next year, but uh, but this year we kind of kind of blew out all the stops with the with the full faction for Cthulhu Wars. You could also, if you just want to be a crazy cat lady, you don't need to get the faction. You can just get the, the figures by themselves. But I think like 1% of the people did that, you know. Well, hey, so, I mean... If your pranks are, are you know, pushing your, your company forward, that's awesome. Well, the best part about our prank was that, um, uh, I, I don't know if it's us doing it or not, but other companies are starting to do pranks too. And so um, Fantasy Flight did an Arkham Horror prank for April 1st this year. And, of course, we had the cat one. They did Barkham Horror, <laughs> the town of Terror of Dogwitch. So they had a dog-based one. Right. And theirs was a joke because they said there's theirs will ship in a thousand years. Right. Right. But whereas ours was a joke that also you got something for. But the fact that they picked dogs and we picked cats, I thought was pretty hilarious. It kind of seems like you guys talked about it and we're like, hey, let's coordinate. Yeah. We didn't know. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, maybe one of them heard about us doing Cataclysm. Because because we actually had people that were playtesting it and stuff at a time because it's going to be a real faction. We have to have to play it, you know, so. Right. All right, so let's talk about your new game that is actually on Kickstarter right now, and that is Eternal Adversaries. Um, and hey. the re first thing I want to point out is how this game actually looks different in gameplay than your others. Yes. Well, one one of the reasons for that is that uh, this game is entirely my game. Um, and I mean that in a way. So basically, my friend Ben Donges came up with the first initial baseline idea for the game um where you where you'd be heroes from different timelines um fighting against the invasion of chaos and his chaos things were sort of like almost celtic fairy lore type enemies you know they were uh, uh and his heroes were things like he had a, a a cheyenne dog soldier brought into the modern times you know or a or a winged hussar or whatever right so so this was the heroes so originally it was a co-op game mm. That we took it and um, and Ben had a great concept. He's not necessarily the most experienced game designer, um, so we took it and we said we're going to work on this. And Lincoln, my son, who you saw earlier, who is my co-game designer, he took upon him the bulk of the work on this. So um, I did. I mean, it was like sixty forty Lincoln and me, right? Sure. Right. <laughs> it's easily that much. Lincoln is mocking me, saying he thinks it's more 70, 65, 35, or 70, 30. But anyway, I did a lot of work on it, too. And uh, so we worked together. We, we made it a team game where instead of being um, co-op, like one team is order, one team is chaos. And um, and you're battling over, uh, uh, over a map well of the U.S. and of Europe to... Um, uh, to save the universe or to destroy it. And the thing that I, one of the things like the, the heroes are of course non-symmetrical. That's what we always do. Every hero is different. Right. And you earn experience as you go up. So kind of like role playing because you're actually getting experience points and adding them to your character and getting tougher. But the other thing that's interesting is that the two teams aren't doing the same things. Like here, like the order heroes are trying to find the rifts that, that are infecting space and close them. 
And the Chaos Heroes are picking up Chaos Tokens here and there on the map and ferrying them to the Arch Evil in the middle of the map and then going back and finding more and taking back to Arch Evil. And so, they're, and so it's not, they're doing different tasks. You know, they're acting, behaving in different ways. Um, also, another difference is that the Order Heroes are generally tougher than the Chaos. Usually one-on-one an Order Hero will kill a mm-hmm. Chaos Hero. But the if an Order Hero is killed, the Chaos, chaos gets a, a, a Chaos Doom for it. And if an, a chaos hero was killed, nothing bad happens to them. So they don't care if they're killed. So they like hurl themselves insensately against the order heroes when they think it's convenient. Like, they, well, I damaged him down by ten points. Yeah, I got killed, but who cares? Because he's damaged. <laughs> right. and next time we attack, we can kill him. And so, and so, it's uh, it also makes you feel different as the guy as the character. Order are like, I can't afford to lose any hit points. I got to kill this guy as fast as I can. And the chaos guy is like, I don't care about die. <laughs> you know, so it's. Uh, so there's, the, the, then there's a final battle. The Chaos Heroes also have um, <coughs> um, the Chaos Monsters that work for them. They're little minions. They have the Arch Evil they're work, that they're working for. And the Order Heroes, they have weapons and they have equipment. They have helicopter strikes and this technological stuff. And Chaos doesn't have any of that. They just have, like, events from the random hells. Like, right. it's, it's the day of war. Everyone takes one damage. You know, so it's it's really different unusual feel right and not only that you also in this game have a whole uh one of the things i noticed that was different in this game that i haven't seen your others is the actually area uh exploration and reveal because you have how many different cards 30 30 different cards and when we go through those cards like they reveal certain events and what else well, the, the 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 map is hugely important in the game, and this actually comes from Ben, but we we loved it and went into it. So, whether it's the map has thirty seven locations. One is where the Arch Evil lives. Six are the start places for Order and Chaos, and the other thirty you put a face down location card on of your thirty, and and you have it. So they're all used. But then as you move around the map, you flip the card over and you're like, oh, this is the Order Shrine. This is the Quartermaster. This is a wormhole. This is a wandering monster. This is a rift. Like half of them are rifts. So there's a lot of rifts. Uh, the rifts have different numbers. That rift four isn't the same as a rift two. Um, and so you're so every time you play the game, you're, you're turning over these cards. You're seeing different things. You're trying to see, okay, where is this useful stuff? Okay, I need to heal up. I need to go back to my healing shrine. And that's way at the other end of the map. Um, and so that's this knowledge that is useful to know. Now, not all 30 locations are flipped over every game. T- most games, I would say 95% of the games, there's several locations left face down. Sometimes as many as a third to 40%. So there's a bunch of the map that you won't even get to see when you're playing, which adds to, I think, more, even more playthrough value uh, yeah. as you're doing through the game. And so every game is different. Plus we have two maps. Now the maps don't have different cards for the locations but the layout of the maps are different there's the u.s map and there's the europe map and um and the connections between the uh the cards and the and uh are different so one of the things for example is when a when a rift opens up it deposits things in the area or you can play things on on areas you can put helicopter strikes on a location or a minefield or wandering monsters can move around the board and block off things and so the map is is changing during play as well as you don't know what it's going to be later at the start. But at the beginning, you have this pristine map, everything face down, your monsters and heroes in the corners getting ready to go in there and uncover. And it's really a, a, an exciting feeling that all that's out there for me to right. find. Maybe I'll find something good, you know. And every time we flip over a location, then every location is either kind of pro-order or pro-chaos. And if it's pro-order, then all the order heroes get one experience. And if it's pro-chaos, then all the chaos heroes get one experience. And one experience is is, is big. Is you only have like 20 on your whole character. So, And usually you don't use, get them all during the course of a game. Right. And I think that's another really interesting element that you guys added to this game because it makes it feel more like a Dungeons & Dragons you know, tabletop RPG game. Yeah, you're exploring. There's right. actual exploration. Yeah, and th- not only that, I was also reading and, and wandering and, monsters. Yes, because <laughs> when you reveal events, there could be monsters going around all over the table. Yeah, and the monster. And then the thing is, after you say you reveal, say a wandering monster thing, <clears throat> well, you can walk over a chaos guy can walk under their wandering monster slot, and he can he can like spread the monsters to new areas from there 
which law can't do. The law can, or the order can only kill the monsters, right? So right. the chaos guy sometimes they'll like spread monsters more, and then be more monsters. And they'll get events that rain monsters from the heavens, and it just, you know, sometimes there's a lot of monsters, and sometimes the order is able to keep them under control. It just so every game feels really different. In addition to the, uh, so you're building a map. Plus, as you play, it just feels different. Plus, your te- your characters may be different. If you have a character who is maybe fast but not so tough, you're running around trying to find rifts and close them, trying to avoid combat. Or if you have a slow, powerful plotter like a Teutonic Knight, then you're trying to go hunt down and kill the monsters to maybe protect your more agile teammate from the from the threat. Right. And I was also <laughs> looking over the rules, and the only player elimination is actually in the final battle. Yes. At, like during the game, if a order dies, they have to go all the way back to the start, and, and like you were saying, chaos yeah. is more throwaway, so they, yeah. they're they're expected to. They're expected, yeah. Well, going back to the start isn't. I mean, the main thing for order is they lose a doom, right? But but going back to the start isn't that big a deal because then you're like, well, maybe hopefully there'll be an area next to your start that you didn't explore last time. So usually you don't you, you want to keep areas near a start location, kind of some of them at least, un explored so if you get killed you can go explore those later on and and have something right and be able right. to explore those areas so that's that's also a strategic element people can put in their mind and you can respawn at any of the three starts for your team so you can be killed instead of respawning in maine you can come back in you know in brownsville texas or something <laughs> um and uh and, and and once again try to explore a new part of the map and hopefully the the char hound whoever killed you last time won't uh won't be in a position to take you out again. <laughs> right? It's like they're just camping your body. Yeah. It's like, okay. Uh, and so this final battle, once the uh, end game condition is hit, how is that? First off, how is that hit? And what does that begin? Both teams are trying to accrue doom. And uh, they're both trying to get as much doom as they can. And, and, uh, the tri- and the chaos team is trying to get to 13 doom which they do by dropping off chaos tokens. When they get to 13 doom, then the game ends and the final battle begins. Law can get as much doom as they want. In theory, they could go over 13 doom. In practice, they never do. Right. Because it's just harder for them to get doom. But the more doom they get, the better. That's why chaos wants to get there as fast as they can. Because the more doom Law gets, the worse it is for them. Because the way the final battle happens is, is that you go into the final battle and each chaos hero takes his his monster that he has that's his little minion and he and he pairs off me and him and one monster and then each pair takes a total damage equal to the law's doom the order's doom so if order had like eight doom then they could divide eight damage among you and your monster so they could put it all on the monster for example or whatever they wanted okay then there's a fight between the chaos heroes and the law heroes and the monsters, and usually the law heroes wipe out the chaos heroes in the fight, but they're hurt pretty bad. Right. And then they fight the final boss. And, and the chaos heroes roll for the final boss and are rooting for him to win and wipe out right. the order heroes. And then he does it probably about half or a little more than half the time. So. And um, right now there are currently what is it four uh, four and four on each uh, team when it comes to characters. There are up to three and three. Three and three. Three and three on each team, um, but there's there's like fifteen or sixteen guys to choose from. Then there's like six uh, or seven uh, arch evils, and you know, yeah, there's up to three and three. So six player game. Right, and in this six player game, like you said, since there's you know, up to 14 to 15 different characters you can choose from, it also adds, again, more to the story replayability. Yes. Not only the characters you choose from, but the layout of the map is different. The the uh, the events and weapons you get, of course, will be different. But also the chaos the, the chaos heroes, each of them come with a, a chaos monster as their minion. Well, there's seven chaos minions. Actually, there's more now. So they could, so like in this game, you could be the goat man and your minion is a... Um, the Tengu, but next game you are the goat man, but your minion is a rawhead. And even that makes a difference in how the game works. Right. And Plus the other guy might not be the same characters, you know? So you guys have funded, you've actually hit, looks like $120,000 already on a $50,000 yes. campaign. You have four days left to go. Um, what other stretch goals do you guys plan? Or is this, is this it? 
Well, uh, as it comes to that, what we have done of late, starting in with last October, is we have done away with stretch goals. Really? We no longer have stretch goals. Um, we have surprises for the players and new things and reveals. But uh, but what you see when you first go into the game is what you're going to get. And um, we first did this with uh, Sandy Peterson's Cthulhu Mythos for, uh, for Dungeons of the Dragons 5e. Mm -hmm. Or we said, look, stretch goals for a book project are kind of a sham because obviously either you wrote the stuff or you didn't write the stuff. It doesn't cost us that much to add it to the book. So we're just pretending that now we're going to add a chapter on ghouls is dumb because we reached a stretch goal. Right. So we said, it's all there. And then it did spectacularly well. So so uh, our next project, Hyperspace, we said, do we dare have no stretch goals on a, on a big figure-heavy space 4x game and uh we girded up our loins and uh clenched all of our muscles tight and jumped into it and no stretch goals it's all right here and uh and that was a big hit we did have some pushback they were like where's the stretch goals we said everything's available at the start right you know you don't have to come back at the end and one of the results was that we had a a higher buy-in on the first day and a lower surge on the last day because we didn't have guys coming in the last day day and saying uh Oh, look at all these stretch goals. I guess I'll sign up now. Right. And so they, they they knew early on, you know. So uh, so I guess the jury's kind of but then, then we and we just like now we're in a rut. We just like we love not having stretch goals, and apparently a lot of people like not having stretch goals. They like knowing what they're going to get. The reveals are still there. The still surprise. Like we just barely revealed that we're adding a dimensional invasion pack for using uh, in, uh, um, eternal adversary in my game, the God's War, where yeah. you can invade the God's War with them, right? Um, and we have we have a couple more of those reveals yet to go. We already did one for Cthulhu Wars, mm -hmm. and uh, and these are surprises that we didn't talk about till the moment they came out. But they're not stretch goals. They're just like here's this other thing we have. Right. So yeah, we're doing we're doing kind of weird. We've always been a little contrarian in the way that we do our Kickstarters. Like we don't have um, exclusives. Um, Kickstarter. We have Peterson game exclusives, not Kickstarter exclusives. So if you can't get something on um, uh, at the Kickstarter, it's not that it will never be available again. It's that it will be available from Peterson Games until we run out. Right. And uh, I know people have told me in the past hey, that I don't. I'm stuck in your pocket. Hey. <laughs> Arthur, I'm in the interview. I can't talk now. Sorry, my production manager <laughs> Sorry. is trying to get a hold of me for something. We, we, we were having an issue with, maybe the same issue as four. We're trying to do something with our elder Shoggoth figure for uh, Demon Sultan. And apparently it's a really complicated figure, and we're trying to decide if we dare to not have a base on it oh. to see one one mold. And it'd be kind of cool to have a figure without a base, so we're... I mean, do, do you think it, it will be able to stand on its own? Oh, it stands up. Oh, okay. It's just it, it, it's just a matter of if if it will look weird because every other figure has a base, you know. Or, but uh, so we're discussing it. Maybe it'll make it stand out, you know, because it's this weird. Blob. And also, it's an elder shaga, so it's not like it has a top and a bottom. Right. It just kind of blobs around. So uh, anyway, all right. Uh, the question, actually, I won't, it's not a question. So really, I want to commend you guys because for me personally, I am not a fan of stretch goals. You know, especially... <laughs> I have made you a happy man. Then, yes, if you I... go into my game right now, you will see everything you're going to get except for the secret reveals. But usually, like this, like we don't have secret reveals on this one that are. But yeah, but but you'll see the hollow space for those anyway. Right. So I mean, because to me, it's like if you had already planned to have these things in your game, but you pulled them out because of a financial thing, you should have planned better. Right. Sure. Well, the thing is, you have a. You, when you're doing your game, you know what the game will cost, and you know what your stretch goals are going to be, so you know how much more it will cost you to do those stretch goals. So they already have to be factored into the cost of the game to some extent. Now, I'm not saying that they're all shams, because they're not. You know, Our stretch goals haven't, right? You may actually cost you more money to do this thing, but they are sort of built into the price already, so you already knew what you're willing to let people have, unless you're right. a complete amateur like I was on the original Cthulhu Wars and threw things in at the last minute like in the excitement of the time and then like got in the shorts <laughs> that was me um so uh so, so yeah so we just said let's just 
let's just fess up to it. We do, do it being a sham and just show and just like, here it is. This is what you're going to get. Here's our stuff. We also try to be open about other things. Like a lot of Kickstarters for a long time were like free shipping. Well, obviously no one's actually giving you free shipping. Right. No, they just right. up the price. Everyone is charging you for shipping <laughs> and everyone is paying more for shipping to Europe than to America. Not only because it's a little further away, not much further away, really, from China, but also because the, the European uh, sales tax, the VAT, is is much bigger than the American tax, right? right? So, and we just barely got this year. American sales tax. The states finally got realized that no one's been paying sales tax on Kickstarter things. So they're so all of us have to fill out fifty different um, little uh, sales tax things, one for each state, and uh, and pay it. But the thing is. That that um, the companies that said there's free shipping, what they were effectively doing was they were building shipping into the cost of the games, and they were having people from cheap companies to ship to, like China and America, subsidize people who lived in expensive companies, right? Countries, but because they because they they'd average out, and so I think that I think that's wrong. You know, I don't think that that a Canadian should have to pay extra so that someone in france or denmark can get it slightly cheaper right. i think that's so we are trying to be really transparent of course sometimes I've, I've had people from from europe actually tell me that that european guys are better to have as backers so that you should be happy to ha have other guys subsidize them but um you know the argument is what it is right so <laughs> no I mean, I, I, care. i'm with you I there. Love backers <laughs> i it, you know uh but uh, in fact, my European backers are a huge percentage of my backers. I just, I just, uh, there's constantly complaining about the cost of shipping. Of course, like every company has the complaint. But since our shipping is transparent, you can actually see what you're paying. Right, and you know, I, I have to say I'm appreciative of one step further when Spirit Island launched, uh, and they disclosed the VAT, and they charged yeah. VAT to nice? to the backers. It was like it makes sense you know you're not hiding any of your costs to us and yeah they got some kick uh you know blowback from it but it didn't hurt them in the long run yeah i mean it's not the spirit island guy's fault that there's a vat right right or an american sales tax which now america's so the vat won't be as bad in the future in effect because since if we're praying playing eight to ten percent american sales tax then another eight percent for the vat isn't as bad but Right. Where it used to be zero to twenty percent, you know, range. Now it's going to be less. Right, but I mean, greed of the American uh, state governments. <laughs> but I mean, and then you don't know what's happening if there's going to be this tariff. I mean, I know everything still gets pushed back. Um, so costs well, we, are always we fluctuating. We just got the change. news uh, initially by Twitter, of course, which is how Trump tells his people things that, in fact, there's not going to be additional tariffs. So. Oh, so they, they've come to an agreement. If, well, because I know that the, he said uh, a few all days I know ago, is there's not going to be additional tar tariffs for the immediate future. Yes, um, which I kind of suspect was be, be the case all along because I because I think that that was always his plan is to uh, be the hero when he didn't have tariffs. Right. And so that happened. So there's that. But we are still doing some due diligence and checking out alternate sources of supply. Right. We have a guy in uh, Taiwan right now, for example. Now, would there ever be a chance in your experience in now publishing, you know, being a and this is something we talked about off camera before being a medium sized company, but with a small type crew um, moving production outside of China and, you know, Asia and ever into the States or is it just too expensive? Well, the thing about the States is not so much that the States, the States is really good at doing some things. But one thing that it's really terrible at is making lots of little plastic figures. Um, okay, and the reason is because, and one of the main reasons for it is because uh, the lots of little plastic figures is not super advanced technology. It's kind of like, it almost looked Bronze Age. If you go there and see them do it, they literally are taking vats of metal with molten steel in it and they're pouring it in the mold using long handles in the middle of the night over a, a, a sand floor so it will absorb the metal that spills. Mm. And all this like, I mean, it's, it, it's, uh, it looks like a 1930s industrial nightmare. And then when the figures come out, they come out, our figures are complicated. It comes out a million little pieces. So, um, so like, it's like our Cthulhu is six pieces, I think. So some, someone has to be paid to take our, the six Cthulhu pieces and glue them to make a Cthulhu, you know, 20,000 times. Right. And so the first part, 
America is good in really high tech stuff, not like Bronze Age stuff. And also, you can't pay Americans to sit and glue figures together. Right. So that helps too. And that, that was one of the issues of looking at Taiwan is that the Taiwan workers are, are paid higher. They're not as willing to sit there. And we go over and I said, we, we, I've gone to the Chinese factory and seen there's all these people in their, uh, you know, late teens, early 20s with their, with their, uh, their phones plugged into their ear doing the uh, gluing together the thing that what I assume is Chinese minimum wage. Right. Um, and uh, there, I mean, it's, it's unskilled labor of the, right? Right. But that's what the kind of labor that you want for gluing together. And that's not something that America shines in. What we are good at is publishing, is doing print stuff. So if we did a game that was like just a card game, that might be something we could do in, in just America. And when I say China does, I mean, probably Singapore or India or other company, countries could do it too. It's not that it has to be China. But China is very familiar with the board game company. They have a lot of Chinese factories that are constantly talking to us and uh, trying to get our business. They're very interested in us. Mm -hmm. um, I've had companies come to us and say, I'll ask them, why do you want Peterson Games? I mean, we're not that big of a company. But apparently we're a prestigious company. Mm -hmm. Like if they if, if they can go to someone else and say, look, we did these giant figures for Planet Apocalypse, then it helps them get more business, I guess, or something. Right. So I guess it's cool to have something going for us. I mean, you you've guys have definitely taken some of the cred away from Simon and, you know, Monolith as, you know, a, a model manufacturer. <laughs> oh, Simon's the guy we're always eating at, right? Yeah. <laughs> we I mean we're constantly trying to we, we respect and love Simon and we're constantly trying to punk them. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean someone's you, got you, right? <laughs> exactly. And you guys do such a fen phenomenal job in your production quality. You know, yeah. that you you have built a, that reputation. Yeah. Have you have you played Cthulhu Wars by any chance? I've played it once and that was a few years ago. Well, just ask me, did you notice how thick the cardboard was? Yes, and that was like yeah, one of the three things three millimeters instead of two millimeters. That little change really has a has a good feel for it, I the, think. The, and that's what I'm talking about, quality. This Your games are one of those that... Uh, I wish I had a sample game to show you guys so you can see what I'm talking about. Like, you'll get these flimsy boards. Um, it, actually, if you guys... Final Frontier's last game, Merry Men. It, it's a good quality game, but they went with the lower thickness cardboard. Ah, uh, well, you know. And, and while I understand it through a, a cost value of why to do it it's just it, it feels like it's going to break it's in your hands good for playing the game right right but it just seems less awesome well we've actually got stung by a little bit because in cthulhu wars originally the faction sheets were made of cardstock not cardboard and it was it was a good quality cardstock it was really good but it wasn't as much as amazing as the cardboard so finally we had to make them cardboard too and cost us more money right but I mean, that, that's what people now expect when it comes to your games and, you know, the expectations are still going to be there with uh, Eternal Adversaries and you, we know we're going to get it from you oh, guys. Yeah, yeah. It, well, it's we, the top quality. We'll, we'll own that, you know, and try to have everything be as, be, yeah, we have dug ourselves into that pit and, <laughs> uh, and it's, you know, it's not the worst pit to be in. No, it, it really isn't. Think of us as the quality company, you know. So and but but I always want to be quality not just in terms of the components, but also of having first rate gameplay. Um, you know that's a that's a that's a feature that I'm I've tried to retain. So that I was really happy the other day when I was watching a review of my game Hyperspace online, and the guy was like, "I think this is Sandy's best game ever. It's so good." And it's, and well, I'm not sure if it's my best game ever. I was I was happy he thought so. You know. Right. I mean, right. You know, I, I'm not a good judge of my own game, so I, I was actually going to bring up hyperspace and the fact that you built a 4x game that doesn't play in 4x time. Nope, that's you, true. You know, and so you guys are constantly pushing barriers on your games on what you can do. So yeah, while you all 4x, you do explore all the things. You know, usually the way they cut back a forest game is by not doing everything. Like you're just fighting or you're just exploring. Right. But it's all there, and it's you play it in like a couple hours. So, and that, that's what I'm saying with with you guys, um, and what your backers and new backers can always expect is that not only are your games going to push boundaries in its quality, but also in its mechanics and gameplay, even in the themes. Well. I like to think so. I've, I've had uh, in Planet Apocalypse is on the verge of hitting the market, 
and uh, I have had a lot of people tell me that it's they think it's the the very hardest and um, most deep solo game they've played. And there's probably a few a few solo games that are actually not solo, but co-op games that are like Dark Continent, which is takes forever to play, right? It takes months to play, which might be deeper than Planet Apocalypse. But Planet Apocalypse is pretty good in that regard. So let's talk, uh, get back into your campaign and talk about what people get for the price. So you have, it looks in like... The campaign? Huh? Okay, here's what you get. The game is nominally $70, uh, $99 in the store. That's our suggested manufacturer retail price. So for 79 bucks, you get the entire game, which has, um, let's see, seven... 14 heroes, 18 monster figures, three boss monsters, and our two ex- our two Peterson game exclusives, a new boss monster and a new order hero, the Anubite. So if you want to be an ancient Egyptian guy with an AK-47, that's the way to go. <laughs> it also has the map with both sides. You have two different maps, and there's like a couple hundred cards and, you know, tokens and, and custom dice and all that kind of stuff. So that's what you get for $79. If you pony up the additional money to get the all-in pledge, which is one thirty-nine ninety, uh, one thirty-nine, yeah, $222 worth according to our official MSRPs, then you add the, um, uh, the, uh, the Celtic expansion with a bunch of new heroes, a bunch of new villains, and a bunch of monsters that are all Celtic in origin, the old one, the raw head. You know, the, 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 the Dark Fairy, um, you know, the Wode Raider and the Scramus Axe. And then if you and then you also get the New World expansion, which has um, basically soldiers from soldiers and, and monsters and enemies from the Americas. Like the Goatman, who is you may or may not know is like from uh, Kentucky. Right. Right. And uh, and uh, the Bat Mother is the arch evil for that, and that's of course the Aztec Camazots. Um, so those are that's what you get for your one thirty nine. You get two big expansions, and you get the core game. And the expansions are big expansions; they're like they're like fifty dollars expansions. We've also recently uh, we have some things you can get in addition to the the that pledge, which is we have gone together. Um, with Dimension Games, who did the game, um, not Dawn of Might, that's what was it called? Dawn of Care. Well, uh, Deep Madness, that's what it was. Yes. Who, who made fabulous figures, and they contacted us, and I guess this is where Sandy Peterson's reputation helped out, and they, they wanted to work with us on a the project we said sure you know you guys are highly successful so we have a dawn of chaos add-on where, where you get figures with stats for um eternal adversary but they're figures made by dimension games so with their awesome uh quality they're actually their own figures yeah and so we have and because of the nature of dimension games dawn and Nanda's game we don't have any order heroes in it it's just all chaos stuff <laughs> but you know there's that. But, I mean, th- those yeah. miniatures look amazing that are on there. Uh, guys, I'm going to have these pictures up on, on the, the right side of your screen. You can see all the different miniatures that they, they have with this uh, Dawn of Madness expansion. Yeah. Also, just so you know, in the um, we usually have a turntable for all the figures in the game. And we have that in this. There's turntables for, for them all. So if you want to see like all the figures... Just scroll down until you get to the turntable section, and uh, you can see everything we've got. Right. And, and that's amazing. And you guys will be closing uh, your Kickstarter on July 10th. It looks like we'll be the... On Tuesday. Next Tuesday. Sorry, the dogs are rampaging around. That's okay. Um, they, they, felt, they felt a sudden need to go from the front yard to the backyard. <laughs> it happens. And to use my house as a shortcut. Um. So yeah, the uh, yeah it ends on Tuesday, and uh, we still have a couple more things to to reveal before then, um, or at least the description of them. We already have revealed the uh, the dimensional invasion pack, which is 
basically just cardboard that you need to take the figures in Eternal Adversary and use them in Cthulhu Wars, the Gods War, Hyperspace, or Planet Apocalypse. And since it's all just paper, then it's really cheap. It's only $15 for all four of them. <coughs> and also, I decided to go the extra mile with these, though, because usually the way I would have done these is I would have said, well, for Cthulhu Wars, we'll just have new monsters you can alley with. But I didn't do that. The, the, the Cthulhu Wars things are actually different they're 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 a different type of unit than you've i've ever had in cool wars before the same is true for hyperspace the gods war and planet apocalypse so that so each of them have a different aspect of internal adversary that has not been previously um uh, seen in those games so it's something new not just like cool figure, cool new figures right well that's amazing well sandy thank you so much for joining us here on board game revolutions live interviews uh, it, it, this has been an amazing conversation. Thank you so much. Yeah, and since you're so close by, um, what I'd like you to do is email us when you're done. Email to uh, my son Lincoln, which is Lincoln at my company's name dot com, and uh, if you want to get into some of our, our playtests. Yeah, that'd be amazing. Thank you so much, Sandy. You bet. All right, and I'll talk to you later. Well, guys, that was Sandy Peterson with Peterson Games. Their game, Eternal Adversary, is on Kickstarter right now. So if you've liked anything that you've seen here today, please make sure to check out their campaign. They only have until Tuesday to uh, back. Um, and then, uh, Sandy, do you ever get, guys ever do late pledges? We always do late pledges. All right. And if you miss out on you the campaign. Because Kickstarter doesn't take a cut. That's right. <laughs> so we make it as easy as possible to do late pledges. That's right. So well, our website name is uh, our website name. Pledge oh, Pledge Master is the is our is our pledge manager, but our website name is petersongames.com. Yeah, for late backing, go to Pledge Master, and you can back a, a lot of our our former things. It's actually our own proprietary uh, um a program, and uh, we've actually been well, that, that making it available to other companies. So that's amazing. So if you guys miss out on the campaign, you can go to their uh, uh, their own pledge uh, manager for a late pledge. It's Pledge Masters, and you can back uh, their game if you miss the campaign. But go check it out. Guys, my name is Marco. That was Sandy Peterson, the amazing Sandy Peterson, actually. Uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you for joining us. You guys have a great day, and we'll talk to you later. Take care.